want to just honor God. And I won't talk too long because it's my family and I have a lot to say to you. I've struggled to find out what God wants me to say, not because I've ever lacked words in my life, but because I want to bring a relevant word. God told me this year, he said, the, the season where we're hitting target is over. Now we're hitting the bullseye. How many know things have changed in the spirit? But before we go on, I have a song for you, but before we go on, I just want to share some stuff with you. You know, um, when my sister from Canada uh, sang about uh, breaking the chains, I felt it was a double-edged sword. I felt like God was breaking the chains off of you because when uh, Jonathan, I think, asked to come take the microphone, I wanted to take the microphone and sing about breaking the chains. But I wanted to sing about an army that is rising. To break the chains. And I didn't know whether that was what was on your heart. But for, for my voice, that's why I didn't get up. And I just thought, I don't know what the protocol is. You know, I haven't been here since 2012. Do I get up and just hold the microphone without an introduction? But I feel like, how many of us feel like we want to do some things? I want to show you something before we do. A lot of times what the enemy wants to do is keep us fixed and fixated on our challenges. This is not a season where you must be fixated on your challenges. This is not a season where you must be fixed on, your, on what you don't have. You are never limited by what you don't have, only by what you don't do. That's a wisdom key to write down. You are never limited by what you don't have, only by what you didn't do. And so God has, I mean, I was reading something a couple of days, I think it was yesterday on the flight, uh, uh, Chuck Pierce and Dutch Seeds have released the word of a season of triple grace. And I thought, I can't be listening to a word of triple grace and still sit in the same place and wait for something to happen. It's been announced what God is doing. And if it's been announced what God is doing, i got to catch up with it. i got to rise and do. It's not about my limitation. It's not about my problems. Because when the prophetic word goes forth, it has overridden your circumstances and your situations but you have to engage with that prophetic word in second kings chapter 7 the bible says this that um the seven the, there were uh, lepers sitting outside of the gate and when uh, the prophet went in uh, in those days the, the famine was so bad they were eating up their children for lunch for dinner for supper and they cried out and even the king says uh, uh, what do you want me to do if god doesn't help us who will but thank god for his mercies and the prophet went in and he announced that tomorrow by this time uh, a seer of flour will be sold for how much you know for literally a penny and he reversed the situation he said what you haven't seen today and in many years you're going to have an abundance of in 24 hours tomorrow by this time you see whenever God releases a word something happens in the atmosphere and something must happen in your own spirit when God released the word there was one man who said how can these things be that's what happens when you fix on your situation when you fix on your situation you see the importance the impossible as an impossibility. When you're fixed on God's word, uh, you already imagine, you transition. That's where I'm going to take you today. You transition from where you are to where you, God said you must be, yet you're sitting in the same place. Do you understand? In your mind right now, when God talks about grace, I'm already in my mind. I'm visualizing some things. Um, it has been a hunger on my heart, and that's not my message for today. I want to see miracles. I told God I'm not bearing another person from cancer. I refuse. Um, I I'm not wanting to see another addicted person and walk by. I want to stop by and say, silver and gold, have I none, but such as I have. I mean, there's a song that says, fill me up until I overflow. I want to run over. Man, I want to be soaking with this thing. I want to be so wet. I don't have time to lay hands. I say, God, I want to pass the grocery shop in Maya, and whoever I pass, let your shadow fall upon them. Let's say, think of your spirit. This is my heart. This is what I'm hungry for. So I'm creating its times. I'm calling. I heard that God is pouring out the Spirit. I'm not sitting there waiting for the Spirit to catch me. If he doesn't want to catch me, I'm going to hold or take a hold of him and possess him somehow. The kingdom of God suffered violence, and it's only the violent that take it by force. I am hungry for something. I'm going under something. So I decided I'm going to create an atmosphere. I put out an ad to my people that I mentor. I have a net mentoring network of leaders. I said, come out here. It's called River Day. I'm just hungry for the river. We're going to sing songs about the river. We're going to call 
call on the Holy Ghost? Jesus said we should ask. He said, you have not because you didn't ask. He said, how many of you, if your children ask you for bread, will you give them stone? If they ask you for fish, will you give them snake? If you ask you for egg, will you give them scorpion? He said, but so God will give the Holy Ghost. I just heard ask. So I'm asking. I don't know about you. I'm asking. Now watch what he's done. He's not allowed me to just go into the healing and deliverance. He's opened corporate doors for me. So I'm going into executive situations with CEOs of banks, and I'm standing there, and I'm being prophetic with the message I'm bringing them. You see, I'm cloaked. I'm, I'm a prophet, but I'm going in in the guise of a Daniel and a Joseph. I look ignorant until I open my mouth, and then I go there into their situations. There is no time. You can't say, fast there's the Lord. They're not inviting me to prophesy. They're inviting me to talk to them about management and performance and leadership, which is, you know, I specialize in that in the church. But I realize the Spirit of the Lord has to go where there's darkness. I realize what Ezekiel told us in 47. Ezekiel 47, he said, wherever the river goes, there will be life. I said, there must be life in our corporate rooms. There must be life in banking rooms. There must be life in political circles. And I began to get invites to speak in political circles. I don't know about you. Don't be jealous. That's how it is. I'm just hungry for something. I'm telling you, I'm trying to whet your appetite for something. I'm trying to whet your appetite that when God says something is is about to happen in 24 hours. You don't sit down and wait for something to happen. He told you FYI for your information, but FYA for your attention too. <laughs> yeah, for your attention. I've got to slow down. I forget I have an African accent. Are you understanding me so far? If you don't just squeeze your face, I'll slow down. I talk very fast because I've got a lot to say and I haven't even started yet. But you know, when the message went out in 2 Kings 7, there were four lepers who sat ostracized outside the gate. What I'm trying to say to you is when God gives a message to his people, when he tells you what he is doing and what he's about to do and what he has done, he expects some action. But because he knows we've been fearful and because he knows we've been discouraged, he causes something to happen inside of us. And that's, what I, that's point one that I want to share with you before I go into my message for today. The four lepers sat outside the gates. I don't know whether they heard what God said or not. But something happened to them for the first time in their life. They asked a question. Why sit we here till we die? Whenever God says there's a season of grace and an outpouring, you have to ask yourself certain questions. Why am I still sitting here till I die? They said, if we sit here, we might die. If we go where the Syrians are, there's food there. We might die. I think God doesn't like people who don't take risks in the spirit. Because faith is risk. Assured, assurance that the risk you're taking will come to pass. It's worth it. But God doesn't like people who don't take risks. They sat there, listened to the questions. They said, if we sit here, we're hungry anyway and there's no food here, we will die. If we take the risk and go where the Syrians are, what if we make it? I'm talking to somebody today. Wipe your tears away and ask yourself, what if I make it? But the first thing that he sent to them, listen to me. The first thing God does is he creates a spirit of dissatisfaction within you. How many here can honestly say you are satisfied with where you are in your spirit life? In your life, nobody. The first thing God creates is a dissatisfaction. I call it the anointing of being fed up. There came a time in my life, I used to line people up. I said, who wants breakthrough? They would come up. And I wouldn't pray breakthrough. I'd pray for them to be fed up because not everybody wants breakthrough. Not everybody is prepared to position themselves for breakthrough. And I realized, let me tell you where I get it from. One day Esau, you know, remember when Isaac blessed Esau and Jacob. And then Esau said to his dad, you know, every blessing you have given, you have said, I'm going to serve my little brother, Jacob. I don't want to serve him. I want my own blessing. But every single word you have said says that he has the blessing. I don't. So he nudged his father and nudged, and his father said, listen, I've said what the Lord wants me to say. And his father attempted to bless again, but he said the same thing. You will bless. You will serve your brother. But one time he said it with a caveat. And the caveat at the end says, you will serve your brother until the day that you get fed up. He said, that day that you will break his yoke from off of your back. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, what you tolerate, you can never change. He said, the thing, there comes a time 
when it gets too much for you, you shake yourself and you break it. That's why no amount of complaining changes anything. But when your complaining moves you into relevant action, something begins to come. Let me tell you, that's what happened with these four lepers. They have it up to here with hunger and famine. They didn't even have toast to cut off and eat anymore. And nobody was going to share anything with them. So these guys decided to get up and go. When I walk like this, can you hear me? No, you can't hear my footsteps, can you? No, my footsteps. I didn't see, can you see me? I said, can you hear me? <laughs> so, they began to walk in their limitation. See, many of us want God to perfect everything before we release a sound. I have, a, I have to have a reason to praise him. No, you don't need a reason. My reason to praise him is that whether I praise him or not, he's still God. By the way, when you magnify God, he doesn't get bigger. He gets bigger in your own eyes. And so, they're there, they're walking. If I'm walking, you can't hear me, but their toes are gone. The leprosy has eating at their toes. So they have an imbalance when they walk. So when they walk, they walk with their clumsiness. See, a lot of times when God says we rise, we're waiting for perfect people to rise. Everything to be in place to rise. No. God said, even in your weakness, in your perfection, rise with tears flowing. Rise with your nose running. Rise with the same situation. Uh, but let the enemy know, I'm sitting down no more. I'm getting up. I'm getting up because you've got something that belongs to me and I'm coming to get it. You've got something that belongs to me. And so they began to walk uh, and began to walk uh, in their clumsiness. Uh, they, can you imagine a whole four lepers going to fight an army because they are hungry. I pray that today you'll be driven by hunger. You'll be driven by a passion. You'll be driven by something that is a desire inside of you that you've never had before. God will never give you what you're not hungry for. He says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, then I'll give it. He's very selective who he gives it to. Oh, read the scripture. So they're walking. But it is this same weakness that makes them clumsy. And it is this same clumsiness that creates sound. And the enemy hears the sound of four clumsy people coming. It is the clumsiness that sounds. Then God takes the clumsiness and lets it sound like chariots of four armies coming together. And so the enemy doesn't hear lepers coming. He hears chariots coming. If God had healed them and they were walking like this, nobody would have heard anything. But God said, I've got you right where I want you. You look like you're weak, but you're stronger. I came to tell you, he said, if you could only look beyond what you call weakness and start to praise me in your weakness, start to honor me in your weakness, I will make, you see, when you're weak, when you're going through pain, there's a certain sound that comes out of you. That's not a manufactured sound. There's a certain song that you sing that is born out of your grief. It's born out of your pain. It's born out of your revelation. It's born out of your passion. When that sound rises, the enemy hears it God is waiting for some people. You know, that's not something I learned from, what's his name? Tim Smith? What's his name? What, uh, what's his name? Smith? Martin Smith? Or whoever it is that wrote the song. A lot of times we're in danger of singing songs that people have written. And God says, I want you to take the song they've written, but let it come out of your experience. Let it come out of an authentic heart. There's a difference between anointing and uh, an authority because authority is connected to authenticity. Oh, authority says this thing is coming from a source. These people walked and the enemy heard something. That is the power of the sound. I pray in the name of Jesus as you sing from now on, you won't need need anybody to push you to say, come on, let's go to another level. You won't need that because there's something crying out. There's a hunger that is crying out. Did you notice when that prophetic word came, how the, something broke immediately and we were released to go forth? Because something came and immediately we forgot ourselves. I pray for you in word of life. From this day forth, you will not be self-consumed. You will no longer be self-obsessed. You are not the object of worship God is. And when you come here, you will raise a song understanding that there 
there is an audience that is hearing you. God must hear differently, but my goodness, your enemy must hear differently. Let there be a sound. That's why I'm excited on a Sunday morning. I think of all the sounds that are released all over the world. Oh God, I think of the sounds. Oh God, in Skid Row in Los Angeles, I have been walking and praying for the people there. Only a couple of days ago, I think of the sounds that are in parts of Asia where people are persecuted. In Nigeria, where Muslims are burning down Christians, I'm sending my sound. Is somebody with me this morning? May God release through you a sound. May you never know, but in the days to come, may heaven testify. Something was broken over a community. Something was changed over, uh, over, over our government. Something was transformed in a home because of the sound you released here on a Sunday morning in Jesus' name. Hallelujah! There's an army rising. Will you help me? Sorry, it's an odd morning. I might as well add to the oddness, right? <laughs> do you want to come see Pastor Miss? Can we do that as our declaration? Yeah. My God, sometimes I wake up in the morning, I stand in the morning. Do you know last night I couldn't sleep? You should have seen me in my room, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. I was just giving glory to God. Man, I was just doing the dance. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know, but I wanted to release something. I wanted to add, are you ready? There's an army that is rising to break every chain. We are taking our place. It doesn't matter. I may be, isn't that a right shame to the enemy that four lepers can defeat them? I didn't tell you the end of the story for those of you who didn't know, but when they got there, when the four lepers got there, the enemy thought they heard sounds of chariots coming. They ran off and they left the spoil. The four lepers ate to their heart's content. They picked up things and they said to themselves, what we are doing is not good. We've eaten and the king hasn't eaten. It's about time some people are in, in Miwok are going to eat. They are going to experience some things before some great names experience some things. It matters what you do. There is an army There's that is an right. Army rising Come on, lift up your hands and declare. There's an army yeah. rising up. There's an army rising up. To, to break, break every chain, chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army. Come on, I'm black, I like loud. Every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I want you to think we are the army. We are the army. Come on, be walk. We are the army.
wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, say, I am the army rising up. And I'm gonna break every chain. I'm breaking every chain. I'm trying something from heaven. Let heaven know you can be trusted with the day. Yeah, I hate the devil. I hate darkness. And I'm desperate to change it. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. where I go the same as it is thank you so much may this place continue to be an international place yeah. where strange creatures and coming to join with your sound <laughs> and change things but that's another sermon are you hungry for more for God yeah. tell him I'm hungry tell him I'm hungry I'm desperate but this morning I believe I really struggled to bring you a pertinent word and I believe that God would have me speak to you from the book of Haggai, Haggai chapter 2. Oh, when I've, yeah, Haggai chapter 2. It's a very strange morning for me. <laughs> As you open it, listen to the words of the song. I couldn't sing it, so I cheated. Listen to you. Great up high. More than you could ask. Despite all that has been done. Say the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And your ladder will be greater. Your ladder will be greater. Your ladder will be greater. Tonight your ladder will be be greater than your past. Tell them you will be blessed. You will be blessed more than you could ask. Despite all that has been done, the best is yet to come. And your ladder will be
us. And now, uh, my message to you this morning is from Haggai chapter 1, verse 9. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. I don't know much about your history except that I think in 2010 when I first came I had wonderful things I think Apostle Barbara told me of a wonderful heritage upon which this ministry has been built but I feel like God is bringing you to a place of change I have wrestled with this all night but the reassurance is this there is a promise if you think you've seen good times, you ain't seen nothing. Yeah. Two things I was telling you at breakfast this morning. I was showering early this morning. I heard the words positioning and posturing for the future. So we're going to be having a conversation around the theme. Why would God tell them the glory of this ladder temple shall be greater? Because... When the elders who saw Ezra's temple that had been built, it looked nothing like Solomon's temple that had been destroyed. They were there when the, you know, when these young ones, when we talk about revival, they might not know. These millennials, they haven't seen anything yet. What they've seen is what they see us do now. But when you've tasted some good old times, and some of you older, mature people, you've noticed, you knew a time when you didn't have to shut your door or lock your door at night. You knew a time when people came to church and they were not so distracted. You knew a time when we spent all day in the presence of God and it was not a problem. You knew a time when we, we, we expected miracles and, and there was no second guessing what God was going to do. We knew a time when holiness meant holiness and righteousness meant righteousness and integrity. We knew a, style, a time when purity uh, was over style. We knew a time when people built uh, ministries from the presence and the word of God and not from adverts. And so, we knew a time when we weren't taught that if you wanted young people to come, you have to have some dark lights and some disco and, you know. What happened to God? He's not enough. We knew a time when sinners had an encounter. People would be down here on the floor. And so when you look at now, it's very dangerous. And you just think, oh, they call this church. This is not church. And that's what happened to the elders. They saw the restored uh, temple and they cried and say, but this is not compar compared to, this is nothing in comparison to the glory of Solomon's temple. And God says to them, the glory of the ladder, however it looks, shall be greater than the former. Because God, an upwardly mobile progress is the order of God. He doesn't stand in one place. He can do better than he did yesterday. <laughs> he said, you know why he said that particularly to them prophetically? Because that was where Jesus was going to descend. There was going to be an era where it didn't matter about the physical. It mattered about the move of God. And I don't know, this is a tough word for me to preach, but because I don't know enough of the semantics, but I'm just going to speak some things to you about change. God is calling word of life to reposition itself. Deuteronomy 2, verse 3 to 8 says, You have circled around this mountain long enough, now turn north. Long enough means you've come full circle. This is how far the path that you've taken will take you. It's come to the end of its time allotted it. It satisfied what you needed then, but no more. Now something greater has to be allowed to come. The meaning of the word, it also suggests that there was an increased extra time. We stayed there too long. I don't know about you, but when we play soccer, we give extra time sometimes. When there's a time, you play soccer? So he understands what I'm saying. An extra time is waiting for somebody to score a, score a goal so that there'll be a champion. And God said, I gave you extra time. But now is the time to turn. What does turn mean? Turn means to face something. To turn away, to look away from something in order to face something else. 
You know, in my country, when you say I'm facing you, I'm talking, I'm not talking about just a physical facing. I'm saying I need some courage and some boldness to face you. To, in other ways, to, it means to prepare early. To turn means to do that. It also means to appear. In other words, to appear in the future God has given you and not stay in your past. It means that the tenure of limitation is over. It is an order to exit out of current circumstances that has been passed. If you keep it any longer, it will rot and do you damage. Remember when an order is passed, it must be obeyed. Other elements are obeying God's commands concerning you. It also means an expiration order has been passed in the spirit over your last place of imprisonment, frustration, and disappointment. God is talking to you as a church collective, but he's talking to you also as an individual. Turn! It's an order that needs to be obeyed. You see, when we don't turn sometimes, when God asks us to reposition ourselves, there's always because there's a bigger agenda. Imagine if your name is a, a Mary and your husband is Joseph and you've just had this miracle baby you're pregnant with and, 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 and you, you know, you're in Nazareth. Meanwhile, the baby has to be born in Bethlehem because that's what the good book says. Only you don't know what the good book says. And they're still faffing about. As we say in England, faffing about means you're just going up and down unproductively in, 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 in Nazareth. You see, God is so concerned with accurate positioning that he'll do whatever it takes to get you there. So what happens to them is that they're not going to Bethlehem. I feel that maybe God spoke to them in their hearts, but they didn't realize it was the voice of God. Because when you're fully pregnant, you really don't want to be taking a long journey to your hometown. But what then happens is this. It's something I'm doing. Okay? What then happened is this. God caused Caesar to change the rules. Suddenly he woke up one day. That's why you must not every, every day be scared at what government says. Because something sometimes is working for our good. Because I read the book and it says God still rules in the affairs of man. Don't make him a small God. He's still in control. However maddening and crazy it looks, he's still in control. In fact, when I look at geopolitics right now, I believe God is taking back his earth. Enough. 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 And so Caesar wakes up one morning and him is fancy because the, the, the children of, of the Israel are under his empire. Then he changes the rules and he says, I need to do a census. Everybody go to your hometown. When you do a census, you do a census for two reasons. You want to know how many people you have who can go to war and how many people you have who can pay you tax. So he thinks he's doing it for himself. Of course, when a census comes up, Mary and Joseph are forced to go to their hometown, which is Bethlehem. You see, they needed to reposition themselves in Bethlehem because that's where the angel was waiting to announce to shepherds uh, that a child is going to be born. That's where Magi are on their way with frankincense to worship him as king, uh, with gold to sustain him as a missionary, and with myrrh to bury him as a Messiah. They are on their way there, but you can't access everything of God uh, by being just anywhere. Many of us are asking for for, 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 for the blessing of God. But you, the blessing of God just doesn't happen in any context. And so, he says, turn. And then even in turning, he tells them, as you go across, the rules have changed. He said, be careful not to fight these people. It's amazing. If when you have time, just read Deuteronomy 1 and Deuteronomy 2 when he talks about turning. Progressing forward means that there's a change order. We don't move forward the same way we did yesterday. I'll pick that up in a, in a few minutes. But Deuteronomy 2, 4 to 6, he says, he says, he tells them who to war against and who not to. What you must avoid to do in this new beginning. They are respected boundaries. In Isaiah 43, 18 to 21, we'll come there in a minute. He said, remember ye not the former things. Behold, I do a new thing. Will you not recognize it? God is on the move because he's not a camper. The tent of meeting in the Old Testament was a simple structure designed to be easily erected and easily dismantled so that his people would follow the cloud of presence. Everything God does is not permanent. <laughs> it serves a purpose. Then it's time to move on. Have you, haven't you recognized in, 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 the, in the middle of the wilderness, he said, you set up camp. But the camp was very temporary. You fold it up, 
when God is moving. In Numbers chapter 9, I don't have time to open it, but in Numbers chapter 9, he warned them. He says, when you see the cloud, pillar of cloud moving, you gather your things and move. If you see the fire moving, you gather your things and move. He said, whether it be one day or three years. Can you imagine you've been going around walking, 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 walking for 10 years, and suddenly we camp, and it looks like, man, we're going to have time to rest. And then two days later, you hear Moses said, let God arise, God is arise. And you know it's time to pick up again. God wants his people to be flexible. We are the only ones who build monuments. So they go to God, you know, that in the transfiguration, Jesus is there with Moses and Elijah. And what do the, it, it, uh, the, the disciples do? They see, they say, let's build a monument. God doesn't like permanent monuments. Uh, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. I didn't say God is not doing anything. I'm saying that we must recognize when something has expired. So we must ask ourselves, what needs to change with us? What needs to change with me? What hinders your progress? We need to change. What habits or traditions do we as a ministry have? I am, I've been asking myself these questions. That's why I'm speaking boldly. Because I've had to dismantle everything that I have. Everything as I've known it. What habits or traditions do we have that become obstacles to our progress? To, as a ministry and as individuals. Can I go to habits first? A six-year-old says, habits are the things that you do that you don't want to do. You want to change, but you can't change them. And if you don't change your habits now, I'm speaking to us as individuals in our personal walk with God, your habits will change your destiny. Ask a man called Samson. Have you ever wondered, sir, why Samson kept going back to Delilah even though he knew? Round one, he told her his secret, and she betrayed him. He went away and quickly forgot and kept coming back. Habits are like that. They destroy you, but you keep coming back to it. They destroy you. Lift up your hands to the Lift up your right hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, today we've spoken and sung about breaking the chains. Lord, every addiction, every habit... Everything that we do, every lifestyle that doesn't bring you honor, that is waiting to entrap us as our downfall, break it off of our lives. Break it off mine, break it off the lives and the mindset of your people. Free us from going back to Delilah day after day after day in the name of Jesus. Amen. Delilah doesn't have to mean adultery. It just has to mean that thing that keeps slowing you down. For some of us, we love our beds too much, not enough prayer. For some of us, I don't know. For some of us, it's depression. For some of us, it's self-pity. And self-pity always exaggerates the problem. Whatever it is for you, may God break it. And then collectively, we have to ask ourselves, what, what tradition? In Luke chapter 7, verse 30, the Bible says that the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, uh, were not, they did not become part of the move of God because they did not, were not baptized by John. In other words, John brought a new era, a way of doing things. Uh, but the Sadducees said, this is not how we do it. This is not how our fathers did it. This is not how we've known. But, but the same God who gives you how it was yesterday is changing his methodology tomorrow. He's not bound by tradition. He's a God who makes today better than yesterday. It's important that we seek the Lord to inquire about the true state of a First. What's happening? What does it mean? How do we get engaged into this? Daniel did it. He sought to understand. When you don't understand anything, you destroy it. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, verse 18 to 19, Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? What does it mean to know? It means to see, to discover, to observe, to recognize. I like this. Uh, this is the Hebrew meaning of the word know. To be instructed by the new thing. To make yourself familiar. It also means kinsman. In, that, in other words, you, you don't let the new thing become a stranger. You, let it, you befriend it and you, you relate to it closely and intimately. And then you declare it. Because this new season is a season of rains. It's a season of access. It's a season of opportunity like never before. Jesus Christ does not judge people only by what they do, but by the opportunity they had that they didn't use. Let me repeat that. Jesus doesn't judge you by what you did. He judges you by the opportunity you had and what you did with it. So let's look at a few things that change demands. Change is the catalyst to a progressive ministry, career, business, and life. It is a willingness to come out of your comfort zone and to change your traditions, your habits, your lifestyle, your manners. 
we must develop, the, a, a, develop a philosophy that sees change as having the potential to make things better. Everybody is afraid of change. Nobody likes change except a wet baby and for very obvious reasons. <laughs> change even when it is planned. You know, a baby when it is planned between a man and a woman, even when it comes, disrupts every part of our lives. That's why we don't like change. Let me tell you, but if you don't like change, you won't be able to move in the things of God. But let me, if you settle in your heart, this thing is going to be disruptive. It's going to, it's going to attack everything, every instinct inside of you when change comes. But the Bible says, as long as the old is still standing, the new cannot come. The world around us is full of change. We're living in a season of change, unprecedented change in the world. And sometimes you've got to look at what is happening in the world to see what God is doing in the spiritual realm. Because everything that is happening right now in our manifested world is, or, is already a sign of something that has occurred in the spiritual realm. So I keep telling people, the day 9-11 came, you could tell that something changed violently in history. Uh, forever, sir. Our lives have never been the same. And since then, it's, just, it's almost just like change has taken on a momentum. Yet few of us who belong to the God of change are afraid of change. And we're not prepared for change. God's principal problem with Israel was not a sin problem. It was a mindset or perception problem. They resisted change and the things that change would bring and cost them. The book of Hebrews was written for the same reason that people couldn't take the pressure and challenges as well as the inconvenience of uncertainty that change brings you. Change takes us to the, from the place of certainty to the place of uncertainty. When you have a place of certainty, you don't need faith to sustain it. When you go into uncertainty, you need great faith. So that's why the Bible talks about some people's faith being shipwrecked. It encountered something God is doing and it stayed there forever. Anything that is not growing is regressing. So what is the power of the old? Or the power of the new? Is that it makes you relevant. It is a new beginning or a new getting started. It is the prophetic awaiting manifestation. When the new comes, it is the manifestation of something that was prophesied long ago. I don't know. Can I challenge you? It's about time now in this house. I don't know what you do. You may do it already. That we begin to bring back prophecies 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. That we dust the cobwebs and beginning to see new things. Because we, have, we are in danger of only seeing things that are happening now. And we are satisfied with too little too soon. We need to bring an appetite back. Your frustration is tailor-made by God to produce ma maturity in you. When change comes, there's a lot of frustration. Like I'm saying, change brings imbalance because we are no longer familiar. The, things are happening. You haven't seen the end of it. And you, are no long, you can't hang on to what you used to do anymore. So we are in what we call transition. Actually, today my message was also about transition. In transition, though, God gives us a new roadmap of faith. He says, I will do a new thing. You've got to trust me. And the Holy Spirit, if we allow him, will teach us how to be present, to be, to be in the moment with God. You see, in transition and in a time of change, this is what God does. Not everybody likes change. But God will offend the heart to renew the mind. And he will offend the mind to renew the heart. Not everybody embraces change. Change can be good and profitable or bad. It can bring loss depending on our perspective and attitude. Changes will come whether you agree with it or not. And even when you don't cooperate with it, it can regress you. Change was created by God to cause nature to progress and evolve into maturity and perfection. Change is a journey and a process that can be spiritual Physical, mental, psychological, or emotional. The only thing that is constant in life that never changes is God. So why is it we always fight change? Just give me a few minutes. I know you're tired, but I'm only here once in five years. <laughs> what are the dynamics of change? We look on the horizon to see what is coming. In a time of change like this, don't stay where you are. 
I heard my sister when she was praying this morning, she says, I don't even know what to pray for. That's why we don't know what to pray for. Because we don't want to repeat the things we prayed yesterday. We want to welcome the new. We want to deal with new enemies before we even see them. When he said to you, the Egyptians you see today, you will not see them no more. He wasn't saying you are not going to fight anymore. He said, these Egyptians, you won't have to fight them. I'm dealing with them. Get ready for the Philistines. They are Moabites. They are Malachites. Because these Egyptians are, are primary, what do we, elementary enemies. You're going to take on giants from this day forth. You have to let go of the present in order to take hold of the future. It, has, it is a painful journey that needs to be done daily. Because future fruit comes from present death. And God allows in his wisdom what he could easily have prevented in his power. Change means that we, want to, we have to want to grow up. Change means that we have to want to go beyond where we have been. I heard Ken say, that we go, is it go beyond you were talking to us about? We have to go beyond. And the, let me tell you this. Don't pray the same prayers that you've prayed every day. Pray, God, I want to go beyond. I don't know what the future holds. I just want to be there. I find, sometimes I find church boring. I didn't say this church is boring. But I, it's too predictable for my liking. I want to go and even when we say the spirit of moving is the same old, same old. Man, I want, it. I want the preacher to go crazy and do something. I want the Holy Ghost to, I want to hear some, some five-year-olds, six-year-olds come forth and take the microphone and say, that's say the Lord. I want to see some healing. Statement. I just want change. I want to see people come out from outside like they did on the day of Pentecost to say, what are you guys? Are you mad? And if you're not mad and if you're not drunk and you're not crazy, then give us some of what you've got. I don't know about you. But you can never experience beyond your appetite. So we must pray concerning our appetite as a church, our desires as a church. We want to go beyond where we've been. In change, we must be excited about the new. On the journey of change, we must trust God all the way because it doesn't make sense. Change me months that you give God thanks for the, and the, for the glory of yesterday and at the same time celebrate the, with excitement the tomorrow that you don't know. As I wind down, Isaiah 43, 16 to 21. Are you still okay with me? Okay. Are you going to tell him not to invite me anymore? Okay. Who is that troublemaker who wants to get me into trouble? <laughs> Am I making sense to you? Okay. Isaiah 43 says this. I mean, I wish I had all that because I'm rushing and jumping. 16, he says, listen, thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth a chariot and horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together, they shall not rise, they are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Listen, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Why? Did he say the former things were bad? No, because I'm about to do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not recognize it or know it? I'm going to make some exceptional things, like making a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. What does it mean to remember not the former things? It, makes me, it means to make continual mention of the former things. Please stay with me on this one so you don't get me wrong. It means to burn incense to. In other words, certain good things can happen in our lives that we over-celebrate. Stay with me, please. Don't get me wrong. Because there's a reason why. Why would God say don't? Because we have to keep. I give thanks for things that happened to me 20, 25 years ago. When we make it our ultimate, there's a problem. When we make it our standard, there's a problem. So good things happened in your life yesterday. But why is God saying don't remember it? Don't burn incense. Don't worship at that altar. Don't idolize it. Don't keep recounting it and recording it as though you can't go beyond it. Because if it is a good thing, God says, watch me. I like to show off. I like to upgrade my last action. I like to show you I can do better than I did today. That's why I tell you we go from glory to glory to glory to glory. And we go from faith to faith to faith. God said sometimes a good thing can happen in your life. And that becomes your standard. So even in your prayers, you're asking God to repeat them. Not go beyond them. You're catching the revelation. And God is saying to Israel, I did awesome things. 
I brought you through that Red Sea. I gave you manna. I caused the waters that brought you through to drown. But don't make it like that's the only thing I can do. Mm, that was just an appetizer. I want you to stretch me. I want you to come and ask me for some awesome things. I want you to show me to show you the things that you couldn't even begin to imagine that I talked about. No, no, he says, but if you don't take care, you can just bow and worship at the altar of the last miracle. And then he says, remember ye not the former things. Now let's go to negative things. All you remember is your pain, Israel. That was Israel's problem. When you get into that mode, suddenly Egypt becomes more appetizing than the promised land. Because now suddenly, I thought you hated Egypt. Suddenly in the midst of crisis, you have an appetite and a craving for garlic and onion. Really? Are you seeing what I'm saying? When things go bad and you keep recounting them, they create a desire for that. When you stay also at a good thing, you limit God if you're not careful. So he says, remember ye not the former things. You are limited by your imagination and what you keep before you. It governs your thinking, your emotions, your lifestyle and practices, your values and expectations, and therefore your faith. What was God going to do? Salvation was going to come. People didn't need to go through all Old Testament rituals to be saved. It wasn't only for the people who sit in front to access the Spirit of the Lord. So great things was going to happen, and uh, uh, he was promising them these things. He knew that you can never possess beyond your expectations. You still with me? He who worships the past will remain there. When past experience is your best teacher, progress is imprisoned. Let me repeat this. When past experience becomes your best teacher, progress will always be imprisoned. Our goal in life is not to preserve history. It is to create it. So I do a new thing. New means unprecedented in its wonderful character. That's what the Hebrew says. It shall spring forth. It shall germinate. It is an image of something silent. But certain gradual growth of events, seeds, and plants. It's been young and developing beneath the radar. It's a bit like Jericho's war. It didn't stand a chance. By the time the people went round it the first time, it had crumbled under. But it wasn't until the seventh shout that it collapsed. So it looks like nothing is happening. But something is really germinating beneath the surface. Do you not know it? Will you not recognize it? We have daffodils. Do you have daffodils here in... In Easter, in Lent, I'm like, they're the most interesting thing to me. I said to myself, so who told them to show up every Easter? <laughs> it's like they have an appointment with destiny. As soon as the calendar changes and we go into, is it April, March, them daffodils of every shape, size, and color on every continent begins to shoot up. It shows you whatever God has ordained. It's just waiting. You may not see it, but it's waiting to make beautiful in its time. It's waiting to shoot up. Sometimes change is important. Please hear me in my last few minutes. Change means things are not necessarily going to be familiar as they have been in the past. Change also means that things may not look like they did before. Change, and this time I'm also speaking to your leadership, if you humbly allow me to. Change means that we might have to change our methodology because the season is different. Now hear me. Moses is about to be taken off the scene. I know everybody says God punished Moses. I don't believe that. I think that was a tactical move of God. Moses is the first prime minister Israel had. Moses is the first one who put a nation together. The nation of Israel did not exist before then. When Jacob brought his kids and 80 of his tribe to the place, there was no nation. 
Israel was led out by Moses, a nation began. He gave them their first constitution. He gave them their first public policy. He put all, every infrastructure for a government and a nation thriving in place. In other words, Moses' grace was an, as an administrator and a pen pusher. When Moses was taking off the scene, look at the guy who took over from him. Josh. Josh didn't have an MBA. Moses did. We know that because in Acts 7, Stephen tells us that Moses was very educated in the things of the Egyptians. When he came to leadership, top of the class. What do you call it? Sumna cum laude? Yeah? Is that okay with my accent? Okay. You know, Moses was brilliant. But at the time that Joshua came, we didn't need to build a tabernacle again. The tabernacle builder is gone because there's only one season for building the tabernacle. You don't need a new constitution. It's already been given. We don't need a new poli public policy. It's already been given. We don't need a new infrastructure. It's already been given. So the time that Joshua was raised by God, if you look at the first chapter of Joshua chapter 1, it was the beginning of wars. Confederacies of armies came against Israel. Israel had never warred before. So God gave them a warring leader. I'm not saying God is changing your leadership. I'm saying when the season changes, the methodology changes. Now we're not doing books and paperwork. It's time to go to war. And so God retires the old gentleman called Moses. And he says, now let the new one come. Now, um, do you know why in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua lacked boldness? Because everybody expected him to operate like Moses. And they didn't understand. There is no, it's irrelevant. That methodology is no longer necessary. It served its purpose for the time. But right now, what you need is a crazy guy like Josh. He don't sleep at night. He's going around looking for ways to bring down Jericho. And when he sees anybody threatening him, he doesn't even take care. Like Moses to see, oh, it is the Lord in the burning bush. He just says, who are you? You got you for me or you know for me because I'm going to draw my sword. I'm going to cut your head off. Speak now. <laughs> the guy is almost irreverent. When Moses sees a burning bush, he doesn't go and attack the bush. He worships at the bush. When Josh sees a man who is the Christ, uh, the captain of the host of Israel, he doesn't take time to recognize him. He draws his sword because the blood is coming out of everything. He sees war everywhere. What a great difference. If you're not convinced, let me give you another difference. God tells David, I will not allow you to build the, t the temple because your hand up is bloody. For many years, I used to think because he was a wicked guy, he killed people. No. The season for Israel was about to change. God says, you can't build me a house because you built it built on, on blood. But I'm, giving, I'm taking Israel into a season of peace. They will no longer create, make their wealth by going to war. Now their wealth is coming through trade. Someone give you a strange leader. Right up till then, every leader they'd had was a warring leader. Samuel, when Samuel appeared on the scene, you know, before Samuel was born, the Bible says, and the Israelites feared the Philistines. When Samuel was born, that was reversed. Now it was the Philistines fearing Israel. When David was born and he got on the scene as a leader, the Bible says, now the Philistines feared Israel greatly. And then suddenly, David is about to die, we are selecting a new leader, and the guy doesn't know how to walk. He's got soft palms like a girl. That's why David had to say, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, but him alone, and the work is great, for it's the work of God. First Chronicles 29.1, but him alone God has chosen. Why? This guy doesn't know. He's, when all the children are playing cowboys and Indians, all he wants is give me a pen and give me a, uh, what's that thing we calculate figures with? Give me a calculator. He's a nerd. <laughs> when people push him and spit in him, he doesn't want to fight. He only comes alive when you put a calculator in his hands. And his father is a warrior. And all Israel has known until then is warfare. And suddenly God gives them a leader. 
who doesn't understand warfare. He has a new way of doing business. Ah, are you still with me this morning? He has a new way of doing business. The vision never changes. The methodology always does. That's why when David is about to die, he calls Solomon and says, bring me the staff list. Let's look at the staff list and the organogram. He said, you see Shammai? Kill him. He's too dangerous. You didn't promise to not to kill him. I did. I kept my word. I'm going. As soon as you put me down there or cremate me, kill him. Don't give him one moment to live. Then he goes down and he says, hmm, Joab and his brother, get rid of them. They are generals. If you put a general in a boardroom where you're talking about GDP, they'll look for somebody to kill. That's why methodology is important. The vision God gave this house will never change. The methods must change. Because the season has to change. The people who you surround yourself with must change. All of them. But there are people, I, please forgive me. I don't know anything. I, have I had a conversation with you, sir? I'm even thinking, I, I hope they don't kill me when I'm done. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. So I'm just trying to tell you, I don't know anything. It doesn't make those people bad. It just means that not everybody has the capacity to enforce the change that is required. So they must be put to another assignment. That does not dishonor them. But that allows them to function with the experience they have. If I looked at your infrastructure, would I see young men and women who understand this world? I've been studying millennials. I so wanted to preach that word. What do we do with these millennials? Because there are a sword that is standing. Whoever handles that sword will determine what the future ought to be. And don't even take me there into speaking about generations. But you, I, please, do you understand what I'm saying about change and methodology? So when changes begin in this church, celebrate it. Don't fight it. Celebrate it, don't fight it. Because the absence of change means the absence of progress. Let me just finish this. I'm not going to be able to finish it till... I want to just talk about a couple of things on transition, and then I'm done. Five minutes. Are you still with me? It's mighty quiet in here. <laughs> he wants to give you guys a new beginning. New beginning means fresh grace, fresh mercies, a fresh chance to have what we didn't have in the last season. A fresh opportunity to get things right, to arrive where God wants us to arrive. It promises greater capacity, new depths of understanding, new levels of unction, new authority, new territories to conquer, new victories. I was going to give you a Deuteronomy, I think 12. He says uh, the place where you are going, he says you will not make water by pumping it like they did in the past. He said, but rains will give you water. Rains will give you water. You are coming out of a place where you exert things uh, to enter into the supernatural but we need to reposition for the supernatural in new beginnings the power of the old is broken covenant is established afresh in new beginnings when Noah landed there he was always Noah but when he landed again after the 40 uh, day flood uh, 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 there was a new covenant cut Moses Jesus all our new dispensations Mephibosheth we are covenant people covenant brings you from obscurity to prominence I promise you word of life you are coming from obscurity to prominence I sat there and I thought these people have a template for other churches that's your destiny. This is not a place that was designed to be hidden. This is a place where people have to come for a pilgrimage. To suck something from you and take back energy. Grace. To see how things are done. I sat here and I watched your young men. I've never been, there's only one church I've been to where little teenage boys can come and when somebody's being prayed for, they have the, the courage and, and the confidence to lay hands. You are partnering something. Do you not know what you have in this church? I pray, to, I speak to the north, I speak to the south, I speak to the east, I speak to the west. We call them in from the north, the south, east, and west. Churches that are struggling, that God will make this place a pilgrimage place. That God will make this place a place where there's renewed energy. They will come and be refreshed. They will come and see how it must be done. 
and they will take it back and they will profit. Out of this place, you have not begun yet. I see where you are going to grow people. And like I said it at the beginning, you know what? It's almost like a bag. Imagine this is a bag. And when you are looking for something, you're empty. Okay, I've got parts back here. Okay? I see God do this to this church. It's not in anger. You got too many fat people. <laughs> too many people filled with grace and unction sitting here. They need to be sent out. And if you don't do it, God will help you along the way. So help you, God. But when you stand here, call the nations to you. Call the nations to you. Call the nations to you. I've stretched my, my and it costs me, I've stretched and extended my time of stay in the U.S. simply so I can get into Bar Apostle Barbara's prophetic conference because I'm hungry to soak up something and take back. That's what this place was designed to be. I, want, I, I see where yeah, people are going to come with their youth ministry, with their children's department, and say, we've read what the books have to say. Now we want something that truly transforms life. We can only get it from this place. It's a new wine skin that God is going to build in this place that is going to be replicated in the nations to come. But you need to position yourself for it. A new begins. New and fresh templates are put in place. Launch out into the deep. The deep means dangerous. It also means places you've never been before. This church is about to get dangerous. Look at your neighbor say, fasten your seatbelts. We're about to. In new beginnings, new blessings are released. Let's finish this. You give birth to something you've been carrying for a while in a new beginning. Have you been pregnant with something? Between commissioning of a new beginning, advancing and possessing the new beginning is a bridge called transition. We are transitioning and it's not almost always the most convenient of journeys. A transition means a going across or over. In Deuteronomy 11, God repeatedly speaks about the process of crossing over into the promised land. The challenge is never the promised land, it is the crossing over. Transition means movement, passage or change from one position, stage, stage, subject or concept to another. It is like transitioning from an adolescence to adulthood. You see these guys when their, their Adam's apple comes and their voices break? You, think, you ask yourself, what hormones are they on? <laughs> they are difficult, right? Okay. It is modulation from one key to another. Those who sing, you have a very high... Have you noticed black people sing deep? And English people sing, Or white people, Caucasian people sing very high notes. So when she started the high notes, I'm like, oh. My mouth was moving, but I didn't dare make noise. But, but, but you transition from do, re, mi, fa, so, la. That's a transitioning. It goes higher. You notice with the la, those of you who sing, you, do you hold your belly in? Your breath is different. It hurts your lung. So you're able to hit the high note. That's what's happening to you. You're transitioning to a higher note. The moment right before a mother gives birth is the most painful and hard. But if she can hang on, just keep pushing just one more time. She's about to rejoice. That's you, word of life. That's why he says, be not weary in well-doing, for you will reap if you faint not. Transitions are not to be ignored, nor treated as business as usual. On the contrary, it involves change and its consequences. Transitions have two faces, death and life. Loss and gain. Beginnings and ending. Grief and anticipation. They possess the power to make or break us, to renew or destroy us. The most significant transitions can rob us of a sense of identity. That's why nobody likes transition. Because you're no longer who you say you are. You don't look like how you look, and you don't look like what the future is. That's why we fight transition. It threatens our security, our sense of belonging, our sense of control, because we like to be in control of things. Our fate remains unnamed, and the verdict on our future is lost in deafening silence. That's why we are filled with fear, despair, and trepidation in transition. Therefore, in a new day with fresh opportunities, we must adjust our thinking. Keep believing and trusting God's word. Adjust behavior. Adjust expectations. Greater, better, more. Recognize new things. 
allow things to die so other things can live. What are you hanging on that does not belong in your new season? Watch out for more of the supernatural in this season for you. Expect the favor of the Lord in an increased way. I don't have time to tell you how much favor is going around. I was telling them yesterday that I've just been offered twice in the last year two 40-foot containers to be able to take relief materials to those who are uh, sick, uh, who are poor in Africa. I mean, a 40-foot container can take five cars. I went in asking. I text my sister. I, there was a flood somewhere, and I helped. And I text my sister, and I said, do you know the address of the shipper so I can contact them? I just want to send a suitcase. Fifteen minutes after I text my sister, I saw the shipper's wife at the grocery shop. And I said, Belinda, I just texted my sister in Africa for your number. She said, what did you want it for? I told her, she said, Pastor Celia, in an African, and she said, you cannot do that. You cannot just send a suitcase. Do you want a 20-foot or 40-foot container? I pray over you that you wake up in the morning and God will make you dizzy with favor. I mean, when she said that, I'm like, eh, what did you say? Because my first thought is, I can't afford, that's a few thousand pounds. I can't afford it. But she said, no, I'm going to talk to my husband. So you know what I did? I said, can I come back to you? Because I was scared. I didn't know whether they'd ask me to pay something towards it, which I didn't have. And then I thought, if I get a 40 foot, how am I going to fill it? Maybe they'll think I'm greedy. Then I thought, but if I go for a 20, will God not be angry? Because, you know. So I'm going through all of these things. So I, uh, I do the best thing that I did all throughout the night. I'm like, when you don't know how to pray, thank God for tongues. It hides it. You know what I'm saying? My faith doesn't have to be swinging up and down, you know. And so I, I, I go to the office the next morning. The first thing they see me is, they say to me, oh, we've got you a 40-foot container. It's yours. We will pay for the shipping. But when it gets there, they said, when it gets there, you will have to pay for the duty. Me have to pay for the duty. Do I look like I have money for duty? So I text a friend of mine in Africa. Within 24 hours, as I speak, she emailed me back. She says, the ambassador in charge of diaspora and affairs for African Union was go is going to take care of the duty. The who? Wow. An hour later, the ambassador emailed me. Thank you for all you're doing for the poor. It's taken care of. The whole thing was taken care of. Went to the grocery. I must stop going to that grocery store. <laughs> I bumped into the, the, uh, the owner of the shipping company again. How did he go? I'd already, we'd gone to thank them and giving them a report. I said, Pastor, you don't just do this thing once and stop. When are you coming for your other container? This time we are making it an owner's container. You own it. <laughs> We're in a different season, people. The things that you didn't dare dream about. Let me finish this by telling you some another story. I mean, this is funny. This, uh, I'm sitting on a flight from the Bahamas. I, in fact, I check in after uh, I'm leaving uh, the Bahamas. And I was on my way to Canada to Alberta, Edmonton. And um, I gave him my British Airways status. I was traveling coach because that was after Dr. Miles Monroe died. Dr. Miles Monroe is my personal mentor. That was my daddy in the Lord. So it was like an income. I was there when he died. Okay. I, he died Sunday night. Sunday night I was in Baltimore. 6 a.m. by in the following morning I was already in the Bahamas. So I had to go back and come back a week and a half later for the funeral. And so I traveled coach when I was going to Canada. But normally if I give them my status for British Airways, they, might, uh, they normally upgrade me. But when I gave them the number, they I gave them the wrong digits. So the lady said, I can't change it. I can't do anything. I went from there to Dallas. They couldn't change anything. They told me they couldn't. Then I went on. I can't remember which other place it was. But when I got there and I told the gentleman, I said, this is what they do. They couldn't change it, but I got the number wrong. He said, oh, don't worry. I can change it. Within a minute, he had. And as I turned to go, he gave me my boarding pass. Something said, why don't you ask him for an upgrade? So I went and I said, sir, can I have an upgrade? He said, let's see what we can do. He said, yes, you can have an upgrade. And then he started to print it, and the thing wouldn't print for a long time. You know, the Bible says there are many great and effectual doors have been opened for us, but there are many adversaries. That's what you have to watch out for in this season. And so, the enemy kept stopping, the machine kept jamming. So they came to tell him, you have to close the plane, and this lady has to be seated, because we're all waiting for her. As I tend to go, the Lord said to me, 
Don't give up. So there's a song that we sing in Africa. It says, Jehovah turned my life around. He turned my life around. He makes a way where there seems no way. Jehovah has the final say. And so I just did my Jehovah thing. Has the final say. Like a mad girl. And I went to sit down. Everybody was looking at me. Because I'm the last. You know, have you sat on a flight and you're just thinking, oh, what does she think she is? Come hurry up and say. And I noticed the stewardess was looking at me for a long time. And as I went to sit down, I took my sweet time. I put my thing there. I'd made a friend. I'd gone out to get a burger. So I carried and I went to sit beside my friend. The flame took off. I was so hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. I took out my gourmet burger. My first bite, I saw the stewardess coming from business class. And she just came. And she came in front of me. She says, Miss Jones. I'm glad to tell you that your upgrade has been approved. My name is not Miss Jones. My name is Miss Collins. So I just looked around like this, and I'm like, okay. She said, no, Miss Jones. I said, me? She said, Miss Jones. I'm like, Miss Jones. She said, Miss Jones, can you come with me, please? Your upgrade has been approved. Of course, I thought she got the name wrong, because my, I did ask for an upgrade, which we were working on. And she's come to get me. So I picked up my burger and she said, oh, forget that burger. I've got something hot. I said in my head, this is an African girl. I just used a whole lot of money to buy this. I took my burger. <laughs> she said, leave your luggage. We'll take care of it. I said bye to my friend and I went to sit there. There was only four people sitting in business class. I ate and drank to my heart's content. After about an hour and a half, I called her. I said, who is Miss Jones? She started to laugh. I'd noticed that a couple of them were laughing with the passengers. I said, who is Miss Jones? You do know that my name is not Miss Jones. She said, yes. This is what had happened. For those of you who always think the end of a matter is the end itself and don't give God a chance. She said, this guy, I think he was a record producer or something. He, was, he had a beautiful girl hanging on his arm sitting next to him. She had a friend called Miss Jones. So he'd ask if, I thought he wanted a trinity, him in the middle of two bevy of beautiful ladies <laughs> sitting next to him. So he'd ask if Miss Jones could come. So they told him when we take off. So when we took off, of course, they approved Miss Jones coming to sit in business class. He got up to go get Miss Jones, and this sweater swore she knew who Miss Jones was. So they had an argument. This sweater said, please sit down, sir. I will go and get Miss Jones. May another never take your place. May no imposter, whatever God has designed for you to possess, whatever he has designed for you to access, nobody called Miss Jones will take your place in life. I was the one who asked for an uh, upgrade. Miss Jones never asked for an upgrade. The, even the steps of the unrighteous will be ordered towards you to favor your righteous cause. She argued with the man and told him, I know who Miss Jones was. Leave it to me. And then she came with Miss Collins instead of Miss Jones. And I ate to my heart's content. And then I finally called her another time and I said, so what did you do with Miss Jones? She said I gave a few peanuts to her to enjoy in her coach seat. <laughs> and I declare to you, whatever God has said you will have, you will have. Sounds funny. But God has strange ways in which he works his miracles. We just have to position, I'm cutting this thing short, but I'm going to have to come back. This is the season of access. Opportunity. We didn't even get to opportunity. So when I come back, we'll talk about opportunity. We did, we, we, we're in a season where we declare a thing and it is established. Rise to your feet.